Now, if we just stopped at beta, we'd probably be okay. That's probably a good 60% of the battle there. But we have to do what's called leveraging beta. And leveraging is just a very fancy word of saying, let's take the considerations of this specific company's debt to equity ratio into consideration. You see, as we previously talked about, companies that have more debt than other companies are seen as riskier. And so their beta should be adjusted compared to their industry average. For example, if I run a movie studio and I have 10 times the amount of debt as you do, another movie studio, shouldn't my beta be higher than yours? I'm obviously way more riskier than you and you're probably riskier than the stock market. So my beta should be pretty high, right? Yeah, that's exactly how it works. And you see, we have to do what's called leveraging beta in order to find out our leveraged beta for our individual company, for exactly how much I own or don't own of debt to equity. Now, the equation to do this is a little bit convoluted, but it's not terribly bad once you understand what's going on. So the equation to leverage beta is debt divided by equity times one plus what's called the tax shield. Now we're gonna get into debt and equity and tax shield in just one second. Let's first tackle debt and equity. Remember the two different ways to pay for anything according to the balance sheet when we were doing financial accounting, liabilities and equity. And sometime, I believe along those videos, we talked about the ratio of total liabilities to total equity. And we called it the leverage ratio. Is if it's higher, if you have more liabilities and you do equities, that means that you're riskier. Same thing here. Debt to equity is once again the same leverage ratio. Nothing has changed in corporate finance and financial accounting. So all you have to do here is just go on their balance sheet or go on your balance sheet, type in, okay, how much total debt do I have? Total liabilities, divide that by your total equity, and that gives you your leverage ratio. Now, what's a tax shield? Well, you see, there's something that's very interesting about debt. You see, debt has an interest rate, and that interest rate determines how much in interest payments you make every year. And you see, those interest payments are taken out of your profits before tax is taken out. Kind of like how if you paid student interest loans or mortgage interest, you can take that out before you get taxed on your income statement or on your, on your income taxes. So same thing here happens for companies. So let's say that I made $100, but I had paid $10 in interest. Well, I only pay taxes on $90, 100 minus 10. What's remaining? 90 bucks. I pay tax on $90. I do not pay taxes on the $100. So every dollar of debt that I add to my kind of debt load on the balance sheet has a little bit of this tax shield built into it. It shields itself from a, from a certain percentage of tax. Now, what's that percentage? That depends on my tax rate. You see, if I have a super high tax rate, then it defends me from a lot of taxes. If I have a low tax rate, it defends me from a little bit of taxes. So my 100 minus $10 gives me $90 in taxable income. Let's say that I had a 50% tax rate. Well, then I'd pay $45 in tax. If I only had a 10% tax rate, I only have a $9 in tax. If I have a 50% tax rate, I am definitely gonna try to borrow more money because I lose half the money that I don't pay in interest pretty much. So why would I not borrow money and leverage up? Now, if only pay in 10% tax, the opposite's kind of there. It's like, hey, I'm not really getting hit by tax too bad. Either way, corporate finance has to take this debt shield into consideration when they do anything with debt. That includes calculating leverage or calculating weighted average cost of capital, which we're gonna do here in a second once we get done with this cap M portion of the cost of equity. But that was a very long way to get down to leveraging beta. Remember that? That's what we're talking about here. Let's get into that right now. To leverage beta, the equation is pretty simple now. All we have is our leverage ratio, debt to equity, times one plus our tax shield. And our tax shield, once again, just to make it 100% clear, is one minus our tax rate. Actually, I don't think I ever said that. So all that you need to know is the tax shield is one minus our tax rate, because that's how much it is shielding us from. With that in mind, let's continue down into what we called market risk premium. Remember that was the third equation variable in the cap M equation. And while it sounds really, really fancy, it's really not. Just like everything else, it's really not that complicated. See, market risk premium is just the difference of the expected stock market return minus the expected risk-free rate return. So we already talked about the risk-free rate. Risk-free rate is something that you would get if you invested in US Treasury bonds. Something that's extremely not risky, very sure you're gonna get paid back on. Now, the market risk premium is just the difference between that non-risky asset and a risky asset, AKA the stock market. Once again, we can calculate this by hand, but it's no fun and it's not that enjoyable. So we go online 
and we find that yet again, NYU has some places, but there's also tons of other resources out there. So all you have to do is just kind of find out, okay, what is the market risk premium today? Type that into Google and you'll be able to find a ton of lists about which ones you should use, which ones you shouldn't use. Now, just to, so you know if you're in the right ballpark or not, the long-term average is right around 3.5%. And so as long as you're not up in like the 15% or in like the negative 3%, which wouldn't make any sense, you're doing fine. Anything in between two and 6% is usually not uncommon. Now we understand all three different aspects of the CAPM equation. Remember, the CAPM equation is just the risk-free rate plus beta, which we wanna leverage in order to be most accurate, times the market risk premium, which is just the difference between the expected return of a risky asset and the risk-less asset, or risk-free. With that in mind, let's run through an example real fast. 